first of a series of five uh, community events that we're going to be holding. Uh, there are some agendas. I believe that they are in the back. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a presentation by the Met Council. On February 15th, we are going to have a presentation on the No Purple Line Coalition. We are going to have the business community speak on February 22nd. We're going to have a resident and non-affiliated comment session on February 28th. And on March 8th, we're going to have uh, the City Council reviewing options and discussing recommendations. So this is a really great opportunity. I know Maplewood has done a really great job of public engagement. Uh, I remember when we did the North End study, uh, very robust uh, engagement to talk about what the North End vision looked like. We also did another community engagement process, and we even did it during the pandemic. Uh, we did it on Zoom concerning the Ponds Golf Course. Uh, this one is going to be on transit, and I think that there's one thing that everyone can agree here is that we all need transit, and transit is something that we need to think about not only today, but what are we going to need in 20 years from now. I am very happy to... Um, uh, present to you Mr. Sable. Mike Sable was our former uh, assistant city manager. He left us to go to Bloomington. He serves as the assistant city manager out there, and he is a very seasoned facilitator. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome our advisory committee. Uh, thank you, folks, for volunteering your time to serve as an advisory committee. Uh, we tried to identify as many groups as we could so that we can truly hear everyone's voice concerning transit. So welcome to our advisory committee. Welcome to our council, our city manager. I see some staff here. And welcome to residents and business folks from our community. Uh, let's engage and, and have a community discussion about transit. Mr. Sable, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Can everybody hear me if I stand this way? If the audio is good in the back. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for letting me come back. Um, I uh, loved working for City Manager Melinda Coleman, and I love this community. So uh, as you said, I do have a, a background in training and facilitation, and so I, any chance I get to use this uh, skill, and I actually love robust community engagement. So this is uh, something I've done for more than 25 years, which is I hesitate to say that every year, but uh, the year the number keeps growing uh, periodically. Uh, my role in this is really quite simple, and it is really to truly be a facilitator and a guide, and to make sure that all of the voices that have a stake in this uh, decision-making process is heard. Uh, I will say at the front end that the decision that this type of engagement is really designed to do one critical thing, and that is to give policymakers information to make an informed choice. That is how the system works, and so I want to make sure that the, the, the governing body has the information that it needs to make a, a, a thoughtful choice. One way to do that is to rely on good data from staff who develop it. One piece of that is to rely on data from the community who have input, who live with these uh, changes to the community. And so it's a collection. There's no one source of information that gives you the right answer to choose, but it is a collection of stakeholder engagement. Um, as you forecasted, there are a series of discussions. So this tonight's is going to be from the Metropolitan Council. Uh, the next group that will offer some input is the Rush Line slash Purple Line group that has some opposition to the, the formation of the line, and we will hear that information. Then there's going to be some information from the business community, uh, both in terms of what it means for them in terms of uh, people, and if it's a retail establishment, what would the impact be on retail, but also for employers, uh, really trying to forecast what their growth is in the business community, and so having that business economic perspective. And then also two sessions for residents to offer input on what does it mean for quality of life, day-to-day -day living in the community. And it's through that collection of all of that information that you can make an informed choice. And with any um, really strategic process like this is. This is a stakeholder analysis. This is trying to understand what each stakeholder, what's important to them, what the challenges are for them, what, uh, and then what some of the outcomes and choices might be. And this strategic analysis really tries to get at the values that people are holding. And so as you think about the, thing, the things that you hear, the, the information that you get from all of the stakeholders, is really try to understand what the value is they're trying to hold. And I'll give you a, maybe a concrete example. If you have a dry cleaner that opens up across the street, 
as a homeowner, you might be worried about traffic and noise and parking and lighting and pollution and smells. And the dry cleaner might want to have a profitable business that does a great service to the community. And sometimes there's a natural tension. And whenever there's a natural tension, it comes before the city council and the governing body to mediate that tension and make a, uh, a choice. And so I uh, would encourage folks to really think about what are the, some of the values that people are expressing when they're talking about what's important to them. I, uh, I hesitate to do this, but I do think it's important to talk a little bit about rules. Um, I have a hard time hearing more than one conversation. It's, uh, it's a function of too many rock concerts. So if we can only have one person speaking at a time, it's helpful for me because I'm going to be taking notes. And uh, it's, I think it's helpful for the audience. So if we can limit conversations to one person at a time, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, I think the other one is to ask questions for depth. Um, this is a very complicated uh, project. It's a very controversial topic. And so probing questions that get at deeper answers rather than just uh, statements, so really trying to get at, at deeper questions. Uh, one of the other ones that I have found uh, recently, I, I, I've read the work of Brene Brown, who's a, an author and a writer, and she often says, assuming positive intent, both in the question that gets asked and in the answer that's given. I think people here mean well, want to do good, want to have what's in the best interest of the community as they define it, and so assuming positive intent and, and being uh, being curious about the questions and both curious about the answers as well. Um, I reserve the right as the facilitator. If, the, uh, if there's disruption, I will actually step into the middle of the room and put an end to it. So I, that's why I'm wearing a lavalier mic and not wedded to the podium. So I will uh, periodically move, move about. Um, so don't be surprised if you see me emerge in the room and, and, and raise my hand and say, I think we're on track or we think we're off track. And so um, I, will, I will do that sparingly, but I ask that uh, don't be surprised if I, if I do that and exercise that. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is that I am I'm truly, as a, as a non-Maplewood staff member, I, I, I don't have an interest in the outcome per se, but I do have an interest and an expectation about the process. So making sure that voices are heard, that they are respected, that they are valued, and that there is good, robust dialogue. And to the community members, I know that there are lots of questions and there are lots of uh, desires to, to say the thing in the moment. And so what I would ask is, because this group has been convened, they're going to go first. There's going to be opportunity for resident feedback later. If you do have questions or things that pop up and you have an email, you can email purpleline at maplewoodmn.gov. Also on the city's website, this is the first piece on the landing page. So for information from the website, you are uh, more than welcome to provide feedback in electronic form. We will also provide opportunities for doing virtual sessions um, later. And so I, to the group, I am here to serve you to make sure that you have opportunities. So I will ask this group if, if there's uh, any questions you have of me as the facilitator. Uh, and if not, I will jump into sort of introductions, if that's okay. Okay, my first question, because I, I do need to do two things. I need to know who you are, uh, and I also need to test your microphone. So I will ask that everybody answer this question. And Councilmember Villa Vicencio, I will run the microphone over to you. But if you would, please tell, tell us your name, um, an agency or uh, community that you're with, and your favorite Maplewood amenity. Starting with me. And I'm going to start with you, so we're going to work our way around. But uh, you name who you are, what you're, who you're with, and then your favorite Maplewood amenity. Sure. Please. Uh, Mike Test. Uh, how's the mic working? Very good. Thank you. All right. So my name is Nick Thompson. I am the Deputy General Manager of Capital Programs at Metro Transit. Uh, what that entails is Capital Programs is uh, the projects that we're building in the region for transit, uh, per, like Purple Line and Gold Line, both of which are within Maplewood and other cities. Our, our light rail system, our uh, facilities, shelter, bus shelters, um, and also is our maintenance staff that maintains the transit system. Those are all responsibilities under, under me. Um, happy that be on this advisory committee. I know it's a very important uh, decision in front of the city uh, and the community on this project this year. Uh, the timeline works great for the input of from hearing from everybody as we inform it. And I hope sitting on this advisory committee as we go through the process, I'm here also for question and be able to answer questions that you have about Metro Transit or other aspects of transit in the region. 
And my favorite, favorite amenity, I live uh, within eyesight of Maplewood on the south side, and I was a big fan of the ponds, uh, so I can't take that uh, amenity since it's closed. Me and my kids used to golf there a lot, so uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, probably the parks, that we, we go through the parks, uh, especially um, down on the very southern end of uh, McKnight there, you know, uh, going on Trout Creek and hike around there and have a great, a great time, so. Thank you. Yes. My name is Torin Gustafson. I am a resident of Maplewood, and I would have to say that my favorite amenity here would have to be St. John's Hospital in the very close proximity. My name is Amanda Dewar. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at the St. Paul Area Chamber. I would say my favorite amenity is the Bruce Vento Trail. Hello, uh, Nikki Villavicencio, City Council member, and my favorite, uh, well, I'd say one of my favorite mem uh, amenities is Wakefield Park. Good evening, everyone. Chan Burili, Maplewood City Council member. I'm a little biased, but my favorite amenity is my house, my warm home. <laughs> but if I have to say something, it definitely would be the Batter Creek Parks and Trails. Mary Lee Abrams, I'm the mayor of Maplewood, and I would say my favorite amenity are all of our parks. I can't just pick out one. I love all of our parks. Kathleen Juneman, City Council member, the N Nature Center. Rebecca Cave, Maplewood City Council. I would have to say my favorite amenities are all the parks, open spaces, and trails in Maplewood. My name is Robert Smaller. I am a, I am a longtime resident of Maplewood. And what is my favorite amenity? Well, my favorite amenity, whoops, my favorite amenity is the Bruce Vento Trail as it is today with the beautiful tree canopy, the wildlife, and the rusty patched bumblebees. Well, that's two anyway. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I know all of those spaces really well. Um, in terms of um, communication and um, process in terms of this, we are going to invite the Metropolitan Council to come up and go through their presentation with some information. Uh, it is, I it will admit, it is a lot of information. And so as you are thinking about it or taking notes, please try to make note of potentially the slide number that they're on. Uh, it's if, it's going to be hard to track. And so uh, if, if we wait for questions until the end, it, you might have 20 questions. And so if you could say, I had a question on slide 13, and it was about this, I think that would be helpful for the staff to uh, at least track and follow along. And I think certainly for the audience members, uh, it's a helpful way to do that. Uh, when it is your turn to speak, there is a little uh, microphone on off button. I don't I don't know how to operate them, but I will uh, ask that if it's your if you're speaking that you look to one of the staff and make sure that we can hear you in the audience. Um, uh, so that's that's one of the pieces I think from there. Uh, I think the other thing that I would say from the from the community standpoint is there's going to be a lot and it will probably feel like drinking from a fire hose. And so this is going to be recorded and so available after the fact. So if you are you wanted to re-listen to a section or hear something else, all of this information is going to be made available after the fact as well as uh, I think uh, live, broadcast live as well. So uh, these are intended to be robust pieces of engagement. And so that's we're going to follow the spirit of that to make sure that there is good engagement, good information sharing, uh, and, and again, um, trying to get the distill the, the wisdom of the community. Uh, and it's a broad section of the community and includes the business community and the, and, the, and the residents and the stakeholders and our and partners at the regional level, including the Metropolitan Council. And I will um, 
after the presentation, we will go through and do a series of questions. Uh, some of the questions might be, as you can start thinking, what was interesting to you? Or what's something new that you might have learned about the presentation? Or what new questions does the information raise for you? So begin starting to think about uh, future-oriented questions after we get through some of the details. So it'll be kind of a mix, uh, but I think we will, uh, I will do my best to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to ask questions and then elicit some feedback about maybe potentially next steps or more information that you would want to have. Um, and the other thing I'll say is uh, I know that this is a, a council dais, uh, dais, I lose track of the pronunciation, but I think um, task force members and council members are, are equal standing in, in this room despite, so uh, while the information is geared towards the council, uh, I would encourage folks who are not on the council to not be shy. So uh, raise your questions. Uh, we need your voice. Uh, your voice is pr important. It's why you're at this table. It's why you're at this in this room. So it's an important voice. Uh, I would encourage you to step up and, and share it uh, when it's there. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the Metropolitan Council. And uh, Craig, would you like to start? Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members and Committee Members. Uh, I am Craig Lamoth. I'm the Purple Line Project Manager. And before I uh, turn things over to some of my colleagues, uh, I'm going to make a quick announcement about the project. Um, it's a slide deck. You should be able to click on it. You're going to pull it up. There we go. It's got it. There we go. So just a quick announcement about some project work that's upcoming in Maplewood. As a matter of course of advancing the design of the project for the last year, uh, we started conducting geotechnical soil borings uh, starting south in St. Paul. Uh, started that in early December, uh, substantially completed that work last week, and now are prepared to move up the corridor further to the north. So we wanted to bring that to your attention tonight. Um, a little bit about that work. Uh, we are conducting... Uh, geotechnical soil boring work uh, along the Bruce Ventil Trail corridor between Larpenter and Beam Avenue starting in late February. Uh, that will likely run through early April, uh, weather conditions uh, influenced. Uh, we will be boring holes about one foot wide near the existing and proposed foundations of bridges and retaining walls. Uh, the geotechnical borings are needed to sample soil uh, in order to determine its properties before being able to build upon it. Uh, pretty much all transportation projects and, and most projects of any kind do this type of work where there's structures involved. Uh, the borings are done using a uh, drilling machine on the back of a truck as pictured here. Uh, we'll be doing that work along uh, the trail width at certain locations where the work is being performed. Uh, the trail will be uh, reduced but no trail closures are anticipated. We weren't uh, closing the trail down in St. Paul for any of the work we've done over the last month and a half. Uh, all this work will occur in the daytime and is not anticipated to make loud noises or disturb nearby residents. Um, and then later this week, uh, we'll be sending out a mailer notification uh, to all residents and property owners that are uh, 1,000 uh, feet on either side of the trail corridor between Larpenter and Beam Avenue. And as pictured here, we'll also be installing signs uh, along the corridor basically at entering any intersection points or entering points for the trail corridor between Larpenter and Beam. So with that, I will turn it over to our Chief of Police. Good evening, everybody. I uh, just want to make sure I got my deal right here. Uh, my name is Rick Grates. I am the uh, Interim Police Chief for Metro Transit and uh, Mayor and the council members and guests and residents, I really appreciate having the opportunity to come and speak with you all here this evening. And part of my quick presentation, I just wanted to uh, basically put it out there who we are and, and what we do. So I just have a few slides here to go through and uh, hopefully uh, give you a better picture of what, what Metro Transit uh, Police involves. We've been around for about 30 years. This year actually is our anniversary. It was created by statute in 1993. At that time, it was primarily a, a part-time police agency um, with officers out riding buses and checking on facilities throughout the system and uh, eventually became a, a full-time agency in 2002 where we hired the first uh, 10 full-time officers and full-time supervisors actually uh, in, tap, in anticipation of the Hiawatha Line at that time, now Blue Line, uh, in Minneapolis. Um, 
we uh, respond to and investigate uh, crimes on, on transit and at our, on our property and, and in our vehicles. And uh, we work hard to be proactive in our deployments as to where we are needed to put our officers. Uh, we keep a, keep a close pulse on that. Um, our headquarters is in our West Command building, which is just north of Target Field in Minneapolis at the end of the Green Line, or I'm sorry, well, both lines, Green and Blue Line. And uh, we do have an East Command where we staff police officers out of that location that's located near University Avenue and Transfer Road in, in the city of St. Paul. And the officers that work in your community here come out of that facility. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, not only we, do we operate under our own st statutory authority, but uh, we do try to have mutual aid agreements with the uh, venues in which we serve, and uh, we're currently working on those agreements now. Uh, they, they need to be updated. Some of them are operated under an umbrella through the county, but most of them are through municipalities, and it helps us work together with the local police departments to understand uh, venues of jurisdiction and, and uh, command and control during, during times of need. Uh, staffing. Um, our current staffing is, sorry, I got off track here. Uh, we're at 100 full-time police officers right now with about 48 part-time and 12 community service officers. That, that sounds pretty robust, but uh, we do have uh, a number of openings. Our, our complement, we can, our, our full staffing amounts is 171 officers, um, and we're working towards uh, fulfilling them, those ranks. Um, our part-time officers, we don't have as many now as we used to. Uh, we, we try to use them more for special events and riding uh, ABRT and regular BRT routes in the cities that we serve. Um, uh, there's been a number of Maplewood police officers that have worked with us over the years, some longtime uh, folks that have, have since retired, and we, we really miss them. We do have an investigative unit that works on all serious crime. We created a real-time information center uh, in 2021. Uh, to keep an eye on the system, watch cameras on our vehicles. I'll talk a little bit about that more as we go along. And, uh, and we do obviously have a robust civilian staff and support staff at Metro Transit Police, uh, including property and evidence, uh, business technology, and, and all the things that go along with supporting that. And I apologize if I'm really talking really fast. I want to be, uh, I want to keep within my time limits and, and I can really get, get off track. So, um, what we do, uh, mission, I'm going to touch on these in the next few slides, but we're really looking at mission-specific patrol duties, our recruitment, our homeless action team, technology, employee wellness, and especially best practices in, uh, in the 21st century model, policing model that, uh, that we strive to achieve. Those, the mission-specific patrol duties that I refer to, um, you know, we really try to keep an eye on police service levels, which we need for bus, rail, and, and to support our facilities folks that are out there working hard to keep the system up. Um, we do have specialty units at the police department and full-time investigations, as I stated. We, uh, um, the specialty units, we have the homeless action team. We have, we have uh, canine uh, officers with, with explosive detecting, uh, detection uh, animals. They're all Labradors. They're all, we use those for special events and, and uh, not only at, at the major stadiums, but uh, when you have community events, we're happy to come out and, and do those sweeps for large things. Uh, they are not apprehension animals. Um, I talked a little bit about our operational deployments. Uh, the big thing is the crime reduction. We have a comp stat model. We have an embedded crime analyst now that we've hired in the last, well, just in the last year. Um, she does outstanding work, and we have biweekly meetings to keep an eye on, on uh, the system and, and, and where we're needed, where things occur. Uh, the one thing I will say in this meeting is that uh, we never really have to talk about the city of Maplewood. It doesn't come up on our on our numbers. Um, so uh, things, are, things are going well for us over here. Um, and change evaluation, it's constantly looking at our change evaluation and, and being at meetings like this, look, listen, and learn, and see what's going on, and, and adapting that to how we do things at Metro Transit Police. Recruitment and retention, this is uh, a statewide issue right now. It's just not related to uh, City of Maplewood or Metro Transit. Um, but what we're doing about that is we've expanded our recruitment team uh, we've included not only our, our sworn police officers, but our civilian employees to help us with that. And uh, really, we're out there trying to find out where we can find candidates right now. Um, we have a very good program in our CSO system to bring people in to be a community service officer and then graduate them into being a police officer after they, they exit school. And we have a pretty good tuition reimbursement program to go with that. So nothing would make me happier than to get local men and young men and women in, in the community here to be part of that program and, and take up public service. 
Um, and, and of course, we really want to promote that at atmosphere of excellence. Sorry. The Homeless Action Team, one of our specialty units, was created in 2018, and, and we're really proud of this unit and the work that they've done. Um, they're out on the system, continually trying to uh, help people with mental illness and addiction that are that are uh, don't have a place to go every night. Um, obviously, we we do we do get folks out on the system that are that are unsheltered, and you know, and, and being overnight on a transit vehicle or a light rail train is is, is not going to get them help the help that they need. So. The team really does well to navigate people to uh, resources, and I think we've housed over 350 people since the unit began. Um, obviously, it seems like a big number, but there's so much more to do. One thing I've talked about in my presentations is functional versus regional, and we find we do a lot of things functionally well in certain areas. Maybe it's in Ramsey County, maybe it's on the other side of the river, and we try to take those best practices back and apply them on the regional level when we're using units like this. Um, outreach and education, um, we're expanding our community outreach and we do a lot of transit specific education. I can think a couple years ago when our transit uh, assistance program, TAP program started, um, a number of our employees at the police department went out along the Route 64, spoke to people in the communities about how they could get on the TAP program and better use Metro Transit and, and, and the resource in an affordable way that's available to them. That's the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, and. Currently, we had kind of a separation of outreach versus recruitment. We're remolding that, rebranding that into a community age engagement team to, um, so that people are cross-trained and, and doing things better. Again, both in a functional level and applying it to a regional level. Um, fair enforcement and evaluation. This, this gets to be a big topic, um, and I wanted to put this in here. Obviously, with service expansion, uh, not only in light rail and, and, and uh, bus rapid transit, um, we look at that. Um, the powers that be look at, even when these projects come along, uh, funding by lines and, and including law enforcement and public safety services in that planning. Obviously, we operate on a proof of payment system, and we're currently looking at that now in its future and how that applies. And, and the one thing I wanted to throw in a little bit, too, going backwards a little bit, was our statutory authority. I've got this uh, number wrong in, the, in my slide. I'm sorry. It's actually... Um, 473.407. If anyone wanted to look that up on the Minnesota Reservoir Statutes, it basically lays out what Metro Transit Police, um, what our authority is. And the 609.855 is, it applies to Minnesota statutes as far as uh, um, things like fare evasion and, and, uh, and, and the rules, uh, criminal rules on, on Metro Transit. A lot of that needs to be looked at, and we're doing that now. One of the things that's going through the legislature is a, is a bill addressing fare enforcement, or at least fare evasion, and uh, in an attempt to decriminalize that so that we can approach uh, fare, uh, fare enforcement in a different level and looking really forward to that. But the ultimate goal of all this is um, uh, the uh, vision of a well-regulated system and getting more presence out on our system. Technology, the one the way we can get more involved in our system are the things that we're doing technology-wise um, with the best practices. We do have a business technology unit that keeps up with everything on the system, make sure the cameras are working, make sure card readers are working, make sure body-worn cameras are working, people are downloading their videos and supporting all that. Um, uh, they just do an outstanding job of maintaining all that. The real-time information center, what I talked about, there's a picture here of one of our police officers in that unit. There's a room with a lot of cameras in there, and basically how that works is if you're riding on a, on a light rail or you're at any of our stations that have uh, uh, fixed cameras, et cetera, these folks are in there watching when calls come in and looking immediately at what's going on. They can watch live video on light rail trains. We're working to put that technology on our buses right now so that they can tap in there, see what's going on, and when police officers arrive, they know who they should be talking to, that they're not stopping people they shouldn't be stopping, and also uh, relaying the best information out as, as our folks are arriving. The one thing I will say they're also doing is keeping an eye on things um, in general, not when calls are coming in. We, they've witnessed things such as overdoses along uh, the systems, medical emergencies, and uh, we give them a lot of credit. They've saved quite a few lives since this program kicked off. Um, the also thing I want to talk about too is uh, we have cameras in our in our BRT uh, ticket vending machines along the, the lines that are being built, um, so we can kind of see what's going on to an extent at each stop. And those folks in that real time information center are, have the ability to look at that and, and keep an eye, uh, a line on that. 
And employee wellness, I, I want folks to know that we do a lot to take care of our police officers and our civilian staff at our department. It's essential to have good, healthy employees. And uh, we're, we brought in a wellness coordinator and a peer support team, and we have a chaplain group there. Um, and, and that's just wonderful. I mean, people, people need to know in the communities that when the police officers are coming out to help them, that they, uh, they've been checked out from the, from the, the neck up, as we say, and, and are in a good mindset to support you. And best practices. You know, I talked about continuous evaluation. Um, there's a lot of things we can do, too. We have continued partnerships with the, transit secu the TSA, Trans uh, Transportation Security Administration, the FTA. There's also a bipartisan infra critical infrastructure bill that's out there right now that addresses transit safety for, for uh, not only riders but employees. Um, so we, we continually evaluate that. Um, we do tabletop exercises, emergency exercises with TSA um, and other partners. Uh, those are things that can be set up. We haven't, I don't think we've done one on over here for quite a while, but um, if we ever wanted to do uh, an emergency exercise with Metro Transit, Maplewood Fire, Maplewood Police, Ramsey County, those options are available. And we, we do that through some of these, these uh, places. And we like to do peer reviews. I think the best way to understand transit is to uh, go on a few field trips. So we, we see what those best practices are on a nationwide level. The principles. Um, continuing to talk about the improvement, but I want to talk a little bit about cultural competency at Metro Transit Police. Uh, I think we're about 50% diverse in our agency. It's our strong point. Um, but obviously we have, we have work to do. Um, we're, we, uh, we have... Uh, I don't even remember how many different language speakers we have now. I want to say it's around 17 different languages that our officers speak, and they're, we're very reflective and responsive to the ridership out there, and I'm very proud of, of those folks and what they're capable of doing. The 30 by 30 initiative is, is simply a commitment to us to make sure at least our uh, recruit classes are 30% are um, women in our group, and uh, I think we're way ahead of the curve on that in our recent hirings and, and where we've gotten in the last few years. And I talk a lot about relational policing being more of uh, engagement versus more than enforcement. So safety workshops um, and working with uh, contracted security and community groups is a big goal of ours collectively at Metro Transit Police. Um, and being knowledgeable, you know, pre uh, uh, pr predictable is preventable. So um, we really want the officers um, well-trained, well-knowledged, um, and, and being able to de-escalate themselves out of things so we don't uh, lead to something else. And I talked about the wellness portion. The last thing I'll, I'll say here real briefly is Metro Transit as a whole is, is currently working on the Safety and Security Action Plan. Uh, it's a 40-point plan uh, endorsed by the Met Council last summer, and it, it talks about including um, improvements all across the system, so training employees, engaging customers that look, listen, learn mentality, and uh, increasing presence and reliable service, and uh, basically giving the, a lot of the, lot of the uh, um, Metro Transit as a whole a little bit of a reboot and, and a, and a rebranding of a, um, fixing up our facilities and so forth. So it's really exciting. There's a link on here for that. And I, I threw a lot of things out there, and I thank you for your time on that, and I'll go to the next presenter. Uh, thank you, Chief. That was really helpful. So I, I wanted to give uh, both the audience and the, and the members, the participants, kind of a forecast of what you can expect. So there's going to be five sections of presentation. So the first one was obviously around safety and security. And so, Chief Grates, I appreciate you, you coming up and being ready to answer questions. Um, and if I say these things wrong, please correct me. But I've, I've interpreted them to be slides 19 through 27 to be around data research and analysis. Slides 28 to 38 are around service and operations. Slides 39 to 55 will be around alignment, uh, history around the alignment questions. And then the final uh, slides, 55 through 58, will be around public, en public engagement and route um, modifications and the process for that. So um, you've seen the first of a total of five. And with that, I just wanted to forecast so folks know what to expect. And if there's one area of focus that's really important for you, you'll know where to focus your time and attention. So I'm sorry for that. I just wanted to clarify. Eric, you're up. Yeah, thanks. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council members, and committee members and residents. Uh, my name is Eric Lind. I'm the manager of research and analytics at Metro Transit. And one of my roles is to analyze data we have on who is using our system, how they're using it, 
And uh, what I want to share with you tonight is a real crash course in um, ridership, what it means, and what we might expect. So I just want to start with um, some basics about what ridership represents. It is, it's an outcome. It's not the only reason to do transit projects. It is not the only uh, benefit of transit projects, but it is one really big one that people are often interested in. So it's an, really an outcome of supply and demand. We have transit supply factors and we have transit and travel demand factors. When they come together, we get ridership. People can use the system. So thinking about transit supply, this is things like, can I get to it? Is there a sidewalk network that lets me get to a stop? Uh, then does it take me where I need to go? How frequently does it come? Am I going to be tied to waiting a long time uh, for a trip, or, or it will be convenient for how I need to travel? And then along with frequency often comes span. So if it's very frequent, but um, you know, only for one half of my journey, if I wanted to leave in the middle of the day and come back later in the evening, is it still going to be running at that time? Things like speed and reliability are important for supply, like does, does the, does the uh, bus or train you know, progress quickly uh, from one stop to the next? And of course, uh, as we just heard from Chief Greats, uh, safety is an important factor of transit supply. People want to feel safe as they're traveling uh, and comfortable on clean and comfortable vehicles. So that's transit supply. Demand is more general, and I think about this in terms of general Travel demand, this is something that's changed a lot in the last three years. I don't have to tell anyone here. Um, but what we generally look at is, you know, what, what are the land uses? What are the origins and destinations that people have? How are people moving between them for many different purposes? There's an important factor for transit demand, which has to do with the cost and burden of car travel. So are people able to drive? And that can be able but don't have a car, it can be able but don't have a license, it could be not physically able to drive a car, lots of different reasons why people might or might not have a car. Uh, and obviously if you do have a car, there are other factors, you know, determining maybe how often you're going to or, or can drive it, including gas prices, which change a lot, things like congestion and parking, which can impact particular trips and make them more or less likely for people to want to drive. As I mentioned, one of the big shifts uh, since COVID came along is the increase in telework. This has really changed our understanding of transit demand and our, uh, you know, how we measure transit demand because of the shift to um, people being able to do their jobs without traveling to a downtown, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, there are many different factors that include people's um, preference for transit in general. So um, taking these together, you know, there are things that Metro Transit or other transit providers can control, which, which largely, largely reside on the supply side. There are other social factors which are largely out of our control, but we have to respond to. And it, when it comes to, um, you know, your, your charge here of understanding what you have to do, um, the, the important thing to recognize is there are things that a municipality um, like yourselves can actually impact like these questions of access and connectivity, which comes back to the land use around transit. Okay, so just some quick overview of our ridership at Metro Transit over the last um, year. So this is uh, recently compiled figures for 2022. We are still very much a bus company. 70% of our trips are happening on a bus. That includes about 10% happening on our existing BRT network. And our metro network, which, which combines the bus rapid transit and light rail to be that frequent all day, all direction service, is serving about 40% of our ridership right now. Altogether, uh, just north of 38 million trips on metro transit over the last year. The next slide is um, to talk a little bit about how our network uh, in the metro network has differed in the amount of investment and the types of service. So um, there's a lot of uh, different projects that have come through over the last 10 years that were incorporated into the metro network. The A-line and D-line are what we call arterial BRT, and those were smaller cost efforts where we're upgrading existing busy bus routes. The red line and orange line represent more of uh, the freeway BRT where we're connecting downtown or the Mall of America, in the case of the red line, to more outlying areas. And the Gold Line project you might be familiar with is one that's in, in progress that will be constructed to uh, serve the East Metro through Maplewood and Woodbury. 
and um, again has the features of um, you know dedicated guideways, so it will be kind of immune from traffic delays and things like that. So the costs of these projects are listed here as one input um, that I'm not going to belabor, but you could certainly take note of and have room for discussion on later. And especially in combination with the next slide, uh, which has a lot of data, so bear with me as I walk you through it. What this slide represents is the top 20 bus routes in Metro Transit and their ridership uh, before and recently during the COVID era. So in dark blue, you see the arrangement of the number of trips that are happening across these routes as of uh, fall 2019. This is what we think of as kind of the pre-COVID standard. And then more recently, last fall in 2022, and uh, if you have a copy or you can zoom in on your screen, you'll be able to see kind of for each route the change or the percentage of that pre-COVID ridership that exists. Uh, and so there's, there's variation, but we're, um, in the most part, we're talking about these core local routes which serve, these tw top 20 serve about 80% of the bus ridership in Metro Transit. And for the most part, they're retaining between, you know, 60 and 80% of the ridership that they had in 2019. So still a great deal of ridership on Metro Transit, uh, even last fall. When we talk about BRT, what we've done is a few different strategies. So one strategy is to build BRT essentially right on top of already busy routes. So for the A line, the C line, and the D line, which just, just opened in December, we are really upgrading these very busy corridors and adding amenities and features to make the bus service even better. There are other projects, which I mentioned, these red and orange line. So the red line, which is now you know, 10 years old, is serving from the Mall of America south into uh, Apple Valley. And it has more of a kind of what we call nodal feature. So basically, from that concentration of um, you know, jobs and retail center, you're going out to these different um, outlying nodes. That uh, ridership is very different than the core bus ridership that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. The orange line uh, doesn't have uh, a blue bar because it only started operating in December 2021. But the, again, that's a freeway BRT, which currently is now serving between 1,300 and 1,400 trips on an average weekday. I'm going to continue talking through some of the ridership, but I'll preview a little bit what Craig is going to talk about next, which is what the forecast is for Purple Line in particular. And shading it here in this group, we can see that the original sort of opening day numbers of uh, Purple Line were thought to be in this ballpark of around 3,500 weekday boardings, which would put it right around Route 64, which currently serves this community. So what do we expect going forward, especially with all these changes that we've seen in travel behavior? We, we know that land use and density is still very much the key for producing ridership along with good transit supply. Propensity to use transits or the demographics of people certainly factor in. Um, but we also know that we need service that meets this all-day, all-purpose need. In other words, it's not tied to a single purpose. It's not just bringing me downtown for work and back home again. Uh, that's, that sort of trip is a lot less than it used to be. And the types of trips that are happening right now are much more kind of all-purpose, supporting um, everybody's everyday needs. So I think I'll turn it back over to Craig to talk through some Purple Line specifics. Thank you, Eric. Just got a couple slides here to talk a little bit about Purple Line. Um, and as it relates to where we see ourselves that Eric was talking about in the post-pandemic uh, era, um, what we're seeing here in this particular part of the metro, uh, in this corridor, is that region ride ridership on core local bus routes, uh, including within the Purple Line corridor specifically, which is on this map, uh, has rebounded more like arterial BRT corridors than uh, the system as a whole. So you'll note here the Route 64, the 265, and the northern portion of the 54 are down about 30% compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, times and that compares uh, pretty comparably to the A line and C line as well. Um, and then just as another point of reference, red line on here, which is closer to that system total of about uh, down 50%. 
So a little bit about uh, where we see Purple Line, um, and this is uh, continually evolving as we continue to refresh ridership forecasts as we are required to do throughout the development of the project. Uh, but we're seeing that uh, we're expecting 5,400 daily rides by 2040. And a little bit about these rides, because I think that's most important, um, more than the overarching number, is that uh, consistent with what Eric has mentioned in terms of what we're seeing in now a pandemic world, uh, what are folks looking for and what types of trips are being taken? Uh, so Purple Line will serve a number of destinations not associated with that traditional commuter market. And you'll note in the graph here that 80% of the trip destinations for Purple Line are outside of downtown St. Paul. So they're not those uh, traditional work trips that we're now seeing uh, often taken via telework. Um, the Payne Phelan neighborhood and Maplewood's uh, North End District are all major trip uh, attractors for Purple Line. Um, most of the Purple Line riders are anticipated to access the line by walking as opposed to park and ride. Um, and, that, and we've adjusted for the fact that we're now uh, seeing different things in a uh, pandemic world than beforehand. Uh, you may recall um, only a couple of years ago as we were uh, completing the environmental analysis that was published in uh, 2021, uh, we were looking at a potential parking ramp um, at the Highway 36 station in Maplewood, and we're no longer talking about that kind of facility any anymore because we're just not seeing that demand from a park and ride from that choice rider that are uh, making that trip to downtown um, office worker. A little bit about the corridor, which I think makes it resilient in um, the post-pandemic areas, that this corridor um, exhibits a high level of transit supportive uh, land uses today. It has accessible station areas. Uh, there's a high presence um, of transit supportive populations, which was also noted in that previous slide in terms of being representing a percentage of the forecast. Folks that don't have uh, cars in their household, low-income households, and people with disabilities. Uh, there's a high proportion of all those populations within this overall corridor. Um, the other thing, as was noted, uh, I think by Eric as well, um, land use is important. The success of these corridors uh, is as much about land use. Um, so proactive planning, and we are building upon that proactive planning that Maplewood's done and that St. Paul has done uh, in this corridor to provide for strong density and affordability of housing. Uh, some evidence of that just within Maplewood is the, the North End Vision Plan. Uh, that was adopted a couple years ago, and then more years ago, the Gladstone Master Plan. Uh, and all of that proactive uh, planning has resulted in grant awards like the one uh, late last year for the Gladstone Crossing that's providing 40 affordable housing units uh, within the planned Frost Station area. Uh, there's also been a uh, growing investment made by multiple public agencies from municipalities to the county in this general corridor area for improving bike safety and walkability within the corridor. That's all important, as was mentioned earlier, uh, for providing, providing access uh, to opportunity uh, that comes through those stations. Um, and we we're continuing to focus on that as part of the project. Um, this project benefits from having got a federal grant outside of the transit project to do advanced station area planning. Uh, it's the biggest such federal grant of any of the transit ways so far to date. Uh, so it's the most robust effort, and that effort is part of that is to identify and prioritize additional opportunities for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure improvements, which will create better access uh, to those stations, and identifying key opportunity sites for redevelopment and coordinating with developers to drive interest toward those sites. Um, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more information about the importance of land use and development uh, to support transit, uh, the Metro Transit TOD department publishes every year a development trends along transit report that was actually just made available and that's the link on the left side of the slide and then there's a link to the department's uh, web page where that full report in addition to the summary presentation can be found as well as past reports with that I will turn it over to my colleague Adam Herring to talk a little bit about service and facilities thanks Craig I'm Adam Harrington I'm the director of service development at Metro Transit Thank you everyone for hosting us tonight to have this conversation. And we're talking a lot about change that's happened over the past few years. And that's really the feature of what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. On this slide, it's really representing the level of change that we've experienced and what we've implemented over the past three years since 2020. And when we compare that to 2019, that's our benchmark, 
And you've seen that used in a couple of the previous slides when we compare ridership on some of the routes in particular that we operate on those top 20. But this really summarizes the big challenge that we faced, particularly in the last year and a half. Uh, you can see on this slide a, a number of blue bars that represents the number of hours of service that we actually deploy on a daily basis. There's a red line which represents the actual number of operators that we have uh, on staff to operate our service for bus. And then the yellow line is the scheduled level of service, the scheduled number of bus operators that we actually have. So you see back on the left side is our August 2019, kind of our benchmark. Uh, and even then, we were short operators. You can see the orange line is a little bit lower than the yellow line. Uh, and then when COVID hit, we suspended quite a lot of service as part of the state guidance on how to address some of the pandemic issues. And so that number went way down. Uh, but we kept our operators on staff, expecting that we'd be able to rebound and redeploy that service. And we did so gradually over the course of 2020 and 2021. Our focus was primarily on those local all-day services that Eric mentioned, where we serve communities that really depend on the service that we provide for not just their trip into the office, and maybe they're not going into the office for work. Maybe they don't work in an office, and we want to make sure we can provide that service for our customers in a re reliable way. So we continue to grow, and by the end of 2021, we were anticipating that we might be able to pivot a little bit and start to add some service back to our network as many of the restrictions were lifted. However, uh, the challenge for our operator workforce really started to emerge at that point, and we actually were not able to add as much service as we wanted to. And with the with a workforce of about 1,400 people, you can imagine that month to month there's transition. We have people who retire and move on, and then we hire and replace. And I'm sure with Maplewood and other entities in the county, uh, probably experience the same thing, where you're not able to replace the people that have moved on. And so that begets, gets to be a real challenge. And you can see the decline, the downward slope between uh, the middle of this chart and towards the right side, where we're reducing service to meet the operator workforce that we have. The most important thing for us and our customers is that when we schedule a trip and you look at the schedule for the trip that you want to ride, that it actually shows up. And we want to make sure we're reliable in that way because there's a high degree of credibility that we want to have with our customers and communities by delivering the service that we promise. The challenge with that, of course, is that we need to reduce the service in order to meet that promise and continue that reliability. And it's not something that we relish, uh, but it's a series of difficult trade-offs. So you can see here on the chart on the left, back in 2020, we were offering about 74% of our service hours to our customers. And as of March 2023, with our upcoming schedule adjustments, we're at about 70%. So we're actually even lower than where we started because we've not been able to keep up with the attrition of bus operators. So what does that look like on the map? So here's our network as it looked in 2019. We've got a number of different lines on here. The blue lines are core local routes. The green lines are commuter routes. And the purple lines are some of our suburban oriented local routes. So just to give you a sense of the breadth of service that we provide and that black line is our service area that we are providing service in. So over the course of this time, that reduction of service looks like this. This map shows the number of trips by the weight of the line. So the more thick the line is, the more trips we reduced or suspended over the course of the last three years. And again, this is not where we want to go, but I just want to illustrate that this has been applied across the whole system. We didn't favor any particular community necessarily. We're really trying to manage how we are able to serve riders, and maintain that service to the communities. So the resulting network looks like this. We still have a lot of really great service in our network. A lot of it's much more oriented towards that local all day type service. And uh, as you may know, the downtown office cores are still not quite where they were before. And even if they're at a 50% occupancy, that might be on Wednesdays. And so when you go from someone riding a trip every day to downtown to them riding once, it becomes a big challenge to provide a service to that market. 
So just to illustrate the change at a system level, so that when you think about Maplewood, it's not just Maplewood that we're, we're looking at here. So Maplewood service changes since 2020. There's a list of a lot of different routes here. We've reduced eight routes on weekdays, four on Saturday, two on Sunday. Uh, we have express service that's been suspended on a number of routes that serve Maplewood. Uh, the Route 270, which serves downtown Minneapolis, continues to serve Maplewood Mall, which is our key transit facility and park and ride in the city on the northern side. But we've also made some improvements on the south end, Route 63, which goes to the east of downtown St. Paul over to Sunray. We actually added a new route that was funded by a federal grant in 2020 to make that connection across from Sunray over down McKnight and over to Woodbury. So it's a good it's a good change, but again, it's a little bit different market that we're seeing. Well, you won't be able to read this chart, but hopefully it's illustrative in showing the number of bus routes that are operating. So the chart on the left shows uh, a column of all the routes that we're cert that we're operating. There's weekday, Saturday, and Sunday as you move across that chart, and those routes on the lower side of it are largely express routes, so they operate only on weekdays. And then when you look at the 2022 bus routes, uh, there's only one or two routes that operate on weekday only that's, that are express routes. But we continue to serve those core local routes that serve Maplewood, uh, even, even at a frequency that's probably a little bit better in terms of what we've reduced in other parts of the metro area. So it's a reduction of about 18% of weekday trips scheduled and uh, 1,300 fewer boardings a day that we're observing between 2019 and 2020. Uh, this is another snapshot of Maplewood itself. And each one of these dots represents the number of weekday boardings that occurs at any single stop. So it's to illustrate that we're really looking closely at where people ride and how often they ride and what are the most popular stops and how that relates to the land use that's in play in these corridors. And so you can pick out White Bear and the 64, uh, which is the light blue line, the Route 54 on here as well. And it's really a before and after. The left, the left map is 2019 and the right map is 2022. Uh, so there's been some changes in terms of the number of boardings. It's not doesn't show up in a significant way on these maps, but we still look towards this type of information to help us plan and make decisions about where we offer service and how often it comes. So that directly relates to the facilities that we have out in our system and in Maplewood in particular. I mentioned Maplewood Mall Transit Center. I'm sure most people here are familiar with it. It's uh, really the connection point and has been the retail center for this part of the metro area for a long time. And we have a park and ride facility there that we manage. We have a transfer, transit center where all these routes come together to facilitate those connections. Let's say you want to get to Century College, but you're coming from west of Maplewood. You can make that connection at the Maplewood Transit Center. So all of those pieces come together. It's an important part of our system, and it's an important part to Purple Line as well. We have a lot of park and ride lots in Maplewood. Uh, and as you can see from these numbers, there's not too many people using them because that's been the single biggest impact to the travel market we've experienced across the system. And so we have that capacity there uh, that we're, we're managing today from a maintenance standpoint and an agreement standpoint with our partners. We have 224 bus stops just in the city of Maplewood alone. Uh, we've got 11, 000, more than 11,000 across the whole system that we manage. Five of those are sheltered with 143 boardings a day. Uh, and I point that out because one of the comments that I heard at an earlier meeting was, wouldn't it be nice if we had better bus stop amenities? Are there things we can do to improve that environment for our customers and our communities? And I always like to say it's the front door to our service. We want to have that be a nice space. So one of the metrics that we use is we have to see a level of activity that's 30 boardings a day when we consider whether or not to put a shelter at a particular location. And then there's all kinds of site requirements that come with it. Um, the maintenance of all of these is no small task. 
and Rich DeMarcus is here with us today if we have questions later on, but his team does a phenomenal job of managing and maintaining all of these facilities, not just in Maplewood, but across the whole metro area, and it's a big job. Everything from replacing glass and shelters to cleaning out parking rides to snow removal, security calls, replacing bus stop signs, uh, all of these things that happen on a daily basis throughout the system that are sometimes invisible at a high level, but you really notice as a customer. And so that's an important part of, of what we do at Metro Transit. One of the things I'll touch on just briefly before I turn it over is uh, we're just beginning a new project called Network Now. We've talked about all these changes over the past three years that have been quite significant to our system and some of the some of the changes that we've made are route suspensions entirely. We've seen new travel patterns. We've got park and rides that are in different states of use and we're at an opportunity now. So I've started out with a bar chart that shows our workforce declining, but we're right at the pivot point right now. We've increased our starting wages for bus operator by 25%. We've got a great hiring bonus up to $5,000. We help train people and they get their CDL license. And we've just started to see some stability. So right now, our next schedule change in March does not include any service reduction. So we're really happy about that. And we're hoping that over the course of the next year, we'll be able to incrementally begin to add more service. But at a system level, there's a lot of things we need to address. And our Network Now project is designed to do that. We'll be coming out to all the communities to hear what the values of transit service is to them so that we can apply that in our thinking about building a plan for the future. That'll be a five-year look at how do we add service as our workforce grows. And that will include everything from our regular local service to how do we address park and rides to what do we do with our express service and how do we integrate our BRTs and LRT service that are programmed to come online. So we have a lot to do, and we will certainly be integrating a community process and inviting Maplewood and other communities to be part of that process. So what's included? started talking about this a little bit, so it's changes to existing routes, frequency and span to the metro lines, discontinued service and facility closures, what, how do we handle those new or redesigned routes, there might be opportunities for new things, and any time we have a chance to improve the speed and reliability of that service, uh, we're gonna take it. But what's not included are changes to the programmed transway alignments. So whether it's uh, the purple line or the gold line, we're not talking about the alignment of the station locations. Uh, we're not talking about fare policy. We're not talking about the transportation policy plan that the Met Council is beginning to uh, update for its next version. Uh, so this will give you just a snapshot of, of what to expect in the coming months. Our Network Now project is planned to be about 18 months long. And at the end of that process, we'll have a good footing to describe how we'll prioritize service improvements over the next five years. So with that, I will hand it off to Mike Rogers. All right, uh, thanks, Adam. I think Craig is going to be there to slide the, or advance my slides. I'd like to start off by saying, my name is Mike Rogers. I'm a transit project manager for Ramsey County, and I wish I could be with you in person today, but there was a positive COVID test in my household, so I figured it was better to be a little bit more discretional on this and do it remotely. So I appreciate the opportunity to still be able to give this presentation to you and give you some information on, on Rush Line and how Rush Line came to be, uh, although I can't be there in person. So next slide, please. So many of you know where Rush Line is right now, or Purple Line is. I'm going to be interchangeable on these. I've been working on the project for too long. Uh, we're in project development, and the Met Council is in charge. But to really know how the project got here, we have to think back to when Ramsey County was the lead. And we have to go way back. So next slide, please. And way back can mean a lot of different things. Um, as we know, that this has been a transportation corridor for a very long time, over 100 years. In the 1870s, the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad was started. It had uh, some bankruptcies and other railroads started. Um, ultimately, there were mergers and acquisitions that carried us through the next 100 or so years. And by the early 1990s, Burlington Northern, the owner of the, this piece of the railroad, said, you know what, it, it's time to divest ourselves of this asset. It's time to offer it up, abandon it. We'll focus our attention 
on our western corridor to get to Duluth instead of on this eastern corridor. So at that time, uh, Ramsey County purchased a portion of the corridor that was abandoned in Ramsey County. Washington County did the same for their piece and Chisago County did the same for their piece. So a number of different railroad authorities purchased this property to preserve it for a future transportation transit use. Um, in the case of Rush Line, which is what this corridor came to be, there were a number of different studies done through this piece of property um, from kind of the late 1990s all the way until the present time. So um, we, we looked at a, a whole host of different things to get us to where we are today. I'll, I'll talk a bit about those, but the, the very first one was really a, in 1998 when MnDOT completed a commuter rail system plan that said, this would be a, a pretty darn good corridor for commuter rail connecting St. Paul to Forest Lake. And the studies have built upon that. So next slide, please. And not only did they build upon that, but the corridor itself grew as people became more and more interested in a, a common understanding of, hey, we've got this north-south transportation access. We'd really like to talk about advancing mobility, economic development, community, and environmental enhancement. How do we do that? What's the best way to do this? Well, the best way that the counties and communities along the corridor thought to do this was by creating a joint powers board where they could share their powers and jointly work for the benefit of the corridor. And though the initial study said it was a 30 mile corridor, ultimately it grew to be an 80 mile corridor connecting Hinkley to Union Depot in downtown St. Paul. And it generally was 35E and, and Highway 61 and it included the old rail alignment. Um, so this task force has been in place since about uh, 1999 and it's still in place today. And when the corridor was really run by Ramsey County, this is the task force that did a whole lot of that early work. So they led the 2001 transit study. They led the 2020 or the 2008 uh, commuter bus feasibility study. They led the 2009 alternatives analysis. And a lot of the, the dynamics going on with this group was, let's look at a long-term solution, but let's not forget about the, the near-term solution. What can we do today to help transit out? So when they looked at things like in 2001 and said, oh, commuter rail, bus, express bus, what could be done long-term in this corridor? At the same time, they were saying, what could we implement today? Could we do commuter buses? Do we have funding from the federal government, from the states, from the counties themselves to implement projects today? And so they, they took that two-prong approach. And what they did for implementing projects today is they did van pools in Pine County. They helped build a park and ride in Chisago County, implement express bus service in Washington and Anoka counties, helped Metro Transit with expansion of the Maplewood Mall park and ride, and again, kept those studies going. And ultimately, out of that 2009 study, uh, things had changed enough that it was no longer a commuter rail corridor at that point. It became a potential bus rapid transit corridor to Forest Lake and Columbus, or a potential light rail corridor to downtown White Bear Lake. So as new information came, became available, new results or outcomes out of those studies came to be. Next slide, please. Um, and as we worked through those studies in 2009, we said, okay, we could either be uh, light rail or we could be bus. What should we really be? We also realized that we weren't an 80 mile corridor anymore for this intense transit improvement. Though the northern sections of the corridor were still very supportive, they didn't have the population density or the destinations to really drive a major transit investment. So that's when the corridor said, okay, it's, we're going to focus on the, the southern 30 miles. And because that leaves 50 miles of rush line task force out there that really doesn't have a skin in the game from a real decision making standpoint anymore, we'll create a policy advisory committee. And that policy advisory committee is made up of cities, counties, uh, business representatives and state agencies that were really focused on that 30 mile piece. And the focus on why to do something there was really sustainable growth and development, serving people who rely on transit, noticing that sustainable travel options are really limited, but transit demand is increasing. So how do we address all those things? And knowing as well that it had been five years since the completion of that previous study, it was decided, let's take a step back, let's relook at this universe of alternatives, let's look at a bunch of different rail and bus vehicles, as well as uh, 55 different uh, route alignments or how you could get from point A to B. And within that, you kind of go, okay, well, then what do we do? So next slide, please. You have to figure out how best to get through all of that information. 
And you know you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time analyzing things that really aren't going to make it at the end of the day. So for rush line, what we did is do a essentially a three-step process. And then that first step, we looked for what can we get off the table because it doesn't make sense. And that could not make sense for th reasons like oh, the technology isn't developed enough to be reliable, or this region doesn't really run it. It's not a suitable technology. So say heavy rail was looked at with station space in every five miles. That's not what this corridor is about. Or a inner city passenger train. That's not what this corridor is about. Same with inner city bus. So those things, we would come out of an inner, the tier one analysis and say, nope, these don't make sense. Talk to the public, get their opinion on it, go to the policy advisory committee. They would decide which alternatives would still be moving forward into tier two evaluation. That tier two evaluation dove a little bit deeper, got a little bit more technical data, uh, provided some recommendations on what should move forward for further refinement, talked to the public about that, ultimately went back to the PAC. They identified what should go into that tier two refinement. Out of the tier two refinement, that's when the deepest dive at this level went in from a, how, what are we gonna get for ridership, capital costs, those sorts of things, uh, ultimately led to the selection of the locally preferred alternative after going out to the public as well with that. Next slide, please. So this is really looking at, okay, what did we use to get to that locally preferred alternative? And the, these um, evaluation criteria were definitely based on the goals that were out there, um, but there's a lot of them. And because there's a lot of them, there's going to be a lot that tend to rate the same because you aren't as deep into the technical analysis as we are today. So at the time this study was done, we didn't have environmental work complete. So we didn't know exactly what the wetland impacts would be or what noise and vibration would be or what cultural and historic properties might be out there. Uh, so they really couldn't differentiate between things. However, we did get cost estimates. We did get a ridership run done. We did have a pretty good idea of what populations were served. So those things did help differentiate between whether it should be a, a light rail or a dedicated bus or uh, some other type of bus service. Next slide, please. And as we were going through this, we used this information, as I mentioned, to go out and talk to the public. So uh, that tier one public engagement, we used things like pub multiple public meetings. We did specific neighborhood meetings in Maplewood and St. Paul uh, to make sure that we got out to property owners along the corridor, uh, being the rail authority corridor that the Bruce Vento Trail is on. We had three large town hall style meetings at each end of the corridor and in, in Maplewood as well. And then we had a public engagement advisory panel to help guide us uh, in how to best reach out to people along the corridor. That engagement got about 90 comments and helped us help guide us into what to do in tier two analysis. And a lot of what we heard there was we need all day transit service. There wasn't a preference one way or the other of should it be bus or should it be rail. Some people like things one way or the other. Preservation of, of what was out there today particularly on the natural spaces side, uh, pursue the best transit investment we can get, but also make sure that it's cost effective. So those sorts of things helped guide what went into tier two. Next slide, please. And when we got into tier two, we had a, a number of alternatives. So we really narrowed things down. We started to look at more specifically at the rail authority, Bruce Vento trail corridor uh, for both dedicated bus rapid transit, as well as light rail transit. Uh, we looked at kind of a hybrid of that where we went over to White Bear Avenue, and then we looked at just uh, arterial bus rapid transit running on White Bear Avenue. And w again, we went out and did multiple public meetings, pop-ups, presentations, significantly more online engagement at this stage. And we got about 1,500 total comments on this. Um, next slide, please. Ultimately, that led us through the, the policy advisory committee to identify a draft locally preferred alternative. And it was dedicated BRT generally along Phelan Boulevard, Ramsey County Rail Authority right of way and Highway 61. And the reason this was out there is it best met the project goal. Um, that I mentioned before, it would also likely qualify for FTA New Starts funding. So uh, at this phase, you don't, formally get a rating from FTA, but you can use what is out there and available. So you know that how much things can cost to be competitive, you know what ridership you need to be competitive, uh, impacts, land use, economic development. You can 
take that in and, and get a good idea of generally where you would be so that you can have an idea of if you would qualify or not. And based on that analysis at the time, we felt that this would qualify for New Starts funding. This project would also co-locate with the Bruce Vento Trail. So one of the things that Rushline did very early on with their task force was say, we're not about replacing the trail, we're about co-locating with the trail. There's enough room to have both uses within that corridor and uh, address both of those particular needs for transportation. Uh, the other thing that came out of this was to further explore connections up to Forest Lake because as this locally preferred alternative was developed, it was found that we couldn't make it all the way up to Forest Lake. There wasn't enough uh, use of the system to take it that far north with this level of investment, but that there was still a desire to have some sort of transit connection as well as supporting additional transit investments on East 7th since Phelan Boulevard was the route chosen. Next slide, please. Uh, so why, why did we use the rail authority right of way or why was it selected? Well, one of the first reasons was it was cost effective. It was already in public ownership. That meant you didn't have to acquire right of way from somebody else to put the corridor there. Uh, it's also the longest route with fixed guideway uh, out of all the options that were studied, which maximizes the development potential at station area. So the more fixed guideway, the more permanency, the more development you'll get around it. Um, gives the best opportunity to be integrated within each city's comprehensive plan for how they want to develop around their station areas. It also provided the shortest travel time between St. Paul and Maplewood, as it was the most direct routing. And it gives a, a great connection between Maplewood, St. John's Hospital, and those communities along the corridor all the way down to downtown St. Paul. Next slide, please. So as part of recommending this alternative, we also went out to the public again. Throughout all the engagement, over 5,000 people participated. There were 200 different community events through this phase. Uh, open houses and public hearing had about 100 people at them. Same for the pop-up table, roughly 65 people at presentations, but we had a, a significant amount of online engagement through our website, through social media, email updates, uh, project mailings and displays, as well as business outreach. So next slide, please. And what we heard, about the draft locally for alternative was both positives and negatives, so opportunities and challenges. Uh, from an opportunity standpoint, people seemed to like that it wasn't light rail because a bus would have less visual and noise impacts. They also felt that being less expensive than light rail was a good thing, um, as well as being less expensive than some of the other routes out there being pursued. Um, possibility to convert to LRT in the future was looked at as a benefit by some if uh, down the road the transit ridership justified it. Buses were perceived as being safer than light rail on this corridor, given its other use as a regional trail. The ability to have a faster travel time was a positive, as well as there being a preference for hybrid and electric buses. On the challenges side of this, uh, how do people actually access the corridor? It's not in a typical location. It's in an abandoned railroad corridor. Uh, it tends to be a little bit uh, less easy to find compared to some other routes. So making sure access is easy and obvious was important. Concerns about potential impacts to existing green space, the Bruce Vento Trail, private park property, those were uh, expressed as well. And then perception that there would be um, an impact to property values uh, or change in character to the neighborhood with the introduction of transit and then safety concerns in the neighborhood and along the route as well with the introduction of transit. Next slide, please. At the end of the day, the policy advisory committee did adopt the bus rapid transit generally along Phelan Boulevard, the Regional Railroad Authority, Bruce Vento Trail Corridor, um, Highway 61, all the way up to downtown White Bear Lake, which is the, the image on the left. And uh, that was adopted by the Policy Advisory Committee. It was adopted by all the cities along the corridor, Ramsey County, as well as the Met Council. And that, that locally preferred alternative as it's been advanced into the environmental assessment, which I'll talk about here shortly, that has been um, updated based on additional technical analysis and environmental analysis to change in places for its routing around Maplewood Mall. It also changed some station locations in downtown White Bear Lake. Uh, and this was done prior to the recent White Bear Lake resolutions. Um, and it changed some of the, the activity around Highway 36 as well. Next slide, please. So overall community in input throughout the, from the start of Rushline 
uh, in 2000 up until the completion of the environmental assessment phase really helped shape which routes and transit vehicle options should be explored, where stations should be, what goals are most important to community member, and how to minimize and avoid potential impact. So that, that has been where the community engagement has been best and has helped us make the best decisions we can knowing that we're still trying to meet the goals set out for the project. Next slide, please. So once we completed that locally preferred alternative, our next step was to say, all right, we, we have a, a great locally preferred alternative, but we don't have a whole bunch of design done. We have no environmental work done. We need to move along that path uh, to move us from kind of that 1% design up to 25% design, to move us from no environmental work to completion of the environmental analysis or environmental assessment. Make sure that we have a lot more information for people so that we know how this corridor would go through. So that work was completed at the end of 2021. Um, and we ultimately in October of 2021 received that finding of no significant impact. We completed that additional engineering work. There was a lot of actions taken at about the 15% plan level uh, by cities to endorse those plans as well, whether it be Maplewood or St. Paul or White Bear Lake, whatever city it, it happened to be where those plans were endorsed. And ultimately with the finding of no significant impact in October of 2021, that's when we were able to transition the project into the federal process enter project development, which is when the Met Council took the project over and became the lead. So next slide, please. And the, the final thing I have to say on the environmental assessment piece is that we had 45 engagement events, engaged um, about 830 people, did it through both targeted engagements at places like Weaver Elementary or Harvest Park, uh, talked to, to the people at pop-ups at open houses. We talked to people virtually as this was kind of bridging that pre-COVID into COVID engagement situation where everything ended up becoming virtual, had interactive maps, did a bunch of station design surveys, and then just uh, general responses to project emails. So we, we tried to be as responsive as we could be to the information people were asking for or to comments they were providing. So with that, I will turn it over to Liz Jones to give the, the last bit prior to us uh, taking comments and questions. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Jones, and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Lead for the Purple Line Project. And I will just give you a really brief overview of the engagement that we did in the summer of 2022. And that was before um, we did some preliminary engagement on our route modification study, before we learned that we had to extend our technical evaluation and postpone our comment period. Um, so in the summer, this past summer, which feels like uh, forever ago with these cold <laughs> winter months we've been having, um, we did hold some one-on-one -on -one stakeholder and business meetings. Um, we talked to folks um, such as St. John's and Arizona Partners, the Birch Run developers, as well as a few uh, residential apartment complexes, including Common Bond Communities, Concordia Arms Apartments, and Markham Apartments. We did also attend a few community events and popped up in community spaces, so the Maplewood Library, for example, um, and the Aldrich Arena Farmers Market, um, and Century College, although not in Maplewood, um, we did chat with a lot of students who um, are Maplewood residents. Um, also did some canvassing and some phone email outreach to folks, um, talked to additional folks who um, live, additional residents, um, as well as canvassing to some businesses near the Frost Avenue Station area. Um, and that included businesses such as Borchard's Meat Market, um, the Maplewood Bakery, and the Gladstone Community Education Center. We also convened um, a community and business advisory committee, and that's made up of folks throughout the corridor who are uh, residents and who live and work throughout the corridor, so business representatives. Both of those um, included folks who live and work in Maplewood as well. Um, additionally, there was some engagement with Purple Line Partners. That's actually um, an advocacy body of businesses that Ramsey County um, convened since switching the project over to Met Council. Um, and so there's businesses and healthcare institutions representing Maplewood and other areas throughout the corridor as well. Um, some of the folks in that group include St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce, um, the Monk Chamber of Commerce, and M Health Fairview. 
Um, also had some project updates, of course, website, social media, newsletters, and that spans um, throughout the whole corridor as well um, as public meetings, met council meetings, city council meetings that were open to the public as well. And then really this slide here, just an overview of once we do get to this point in the project and do go out for engagement for our route modification study on options that we know do work um, for the communities, we will continue to have same activities that we did in the summer. So talking to folks um, individually, individual businesses and group business meetings, um, continued conversations with folks. Um, we're, we'll plan to have a survey as well. So survey available virtually and also printed out. We like to have printed versions um, for when we're canvassing um, or at community events, um, planning for an interactive map to help folks uh, who are online really see the different options and be able to provide feedback in that way as well. Um, working with neighborhood, community and business groups and spreading the word through those folks and having presentations with them as well. Community events, we really like to meet folks where they are and attend existing events in communities where events are already happening, otherwise popping up in community spaces. Um, so similar to before when we popped up at the library or attended the farmer's market. So would plan to have events like those and also just separate hosted open house events, including in person and virtual. Um, continued engagement with our community and business advisory committee um, and corridor management committee. That's where meetings are open to the public and there's policymakers um, from throughout the corridor. And then just really a number of project materials. Once we get to this point, there um, will be a lot of information and questions. So just trying to have clarity translated materials as well to help explain the initiative and what options are for folks. Um, canvassing um, to businesses, residents, tran existing transit facilities. Um, of course, updating the website and having our social media virtual and printed communications as well. Just wanted to give a high level overview of that. And with that, I will turn it back to our facilitator. Uh, thank you very much to the Metropolitan Council staff and for people uh, watching at home or listening. That was 58 slides, uh, significant amount of uh, information. And I know that there was, as I shared, it was sort of broken into five broad categories. Again, if I get it uh, around safety and security around research and analysis, uh, services and facilities, alignment and then engagement and, and, and then community engagement. So those five sections. Um, there I'm sure, I suspect that there are going to be a lot of questions about uh, what information that you heard. I think the first set of questions that I would ask is, what questions do you have of the Met Council staff for clarity? Maybe it was a point that you wanted to hear again or a, a different uh, comment that maybe you want repeated. So what questions for clarity do you have for uh, I, any of the staff who presented information today? Uh, and if, again, as I tried to share earlier, if you could try to reference the slide number that you were referring to, that'll help us get the right uh, Metropolitan Council staff member up to present. And so um, I will open it up to the group. I will make room at the podium for the, for the presenters to speak. I'll probably walk over there and just, uh, just a show of hands. Who has questions for clarity? And I'll, I'll open it up to the group. Amanda, what's your question, please? Yeah, thank you. And, and perhaps I missed it. There was a period with some commotion up here. But um, it, it, there was discussion, you know, the locally preferred alternative was adopted, got approved with the Fonzi, et cetera but then um, talked about the route modification study engagement plan. So like what happened in between from the local um, preferred you know, alternative being approved to now needing to um, study a, a, a modification to the route? Thanks for the question. Um, I can handle that. Uh, so the local preferred alternative was recommended and adopted into the long range plan in 2017. And um, basically March of last year, there was a resolution passed by the city of White Bear Lake asking for the locally preferred alternative not to come to the city. And in response to that, in April of last year, we initiated the route modification study, which has essentially been underway since that time, looking at different possible endpoints and routings to those endpoints in Vadnais Heights and in Maplewood, as well as going to Century College.
Who else has a question for Clarity? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> I have to learn how to use the microphone. Um, Diana Longry from the No Rush Line Coalition. Uh, with regard to talking about some of the uh, safety issues, um, I didn't hear you uh, talk about um, the status of the Transit Ambassadors Program that I, I think you were looking to implement before COVID started. What is the status of that? Is that still something that's ongoing? I can speak for that. And again, uh, thank you. I'm Rick Gritz, the interim chief. Yeah, the Transit Ambassador Program is something that's going through bus operations right now. We've we've separated that. It's not an internal police function. It's uh, they're being trained on, on. Uh, well, let me back up. They're working on that as far as uh, uh, incorporating them to bus and rail operations, uh, teaching them on the mul you know how to use the multi modes, and then in, and working with the police department to have a component on. You know, what's the best way to incorporate those civilian people, those ambassadors, in with our police department where they're out on the system, they're helping with wayfinding. Uh, eventually, uh, if the legislature passes the, uh, the revision to the, the fair revision bill that's going on right now, they, they may be called upon in the future to actually be those persons out checking fares with police officers or CSOs and having that uh, component on the system. And that still is being worked on right now even behind the scenes as the legislature is convened. So they're not currently then on the buses or the BRTs or the, uh, the light rails? No, they're not. The, the, uh, I'm not even sure when they're going to be posting the positions. They're I not see. done yet. Very yeah. good. Uh, Councilmember Juneman, question. Thank you, Mike. Um, in two different places, you referred to the, the safety and security action plan. And action plans have a track record of being ending up on a shelf and not becoming reality. So can you tell me like the five major points of that action plan and if, is there a timeline and? You know, I, I uh, thank you for the question, council member. I, uh, the, the action plan is broad based across Metro Transit. So it does involve police, it does involve facilities, um, bus and rail and certain different metrics uh, within uh, Metro Transit in and of itself. And each one of us tasked in that group isn't specifically um, doing all the one things in the action plan, right? So what we do is, like me for the public safety portion of it, we're trying to identify things like staffing. How do we do better recruitment? How do we, how, I'm sorry, um, uh, where are we at with recruitment? Where are we at with brides and staffing the system? And then we're giving quarter re quarterly reports on that to the Metropolitan Council, and I do believe those are uh, recorded meetings and the quarterly updates are online and available to look at. I just think because safety is such a concern for so many people that more attention needs to be paid to that, and I think there has to be a really good communication of what it looks like and when it's going to be coming into use, because I think that's part of the issue with the whole plan. Yeah, absolutely, and I understand the, the concept that it could be seen as being tabled, and it really is an ongoing effort, um, full speed ahead with it. And it's gonna take some time. Updates would be good. Thank you very much. I saw Councilmember Villavicencio has a question, and I'm gonna provide a microphone for you to ask your question. Thank you. Um, my question is along the lines of uh, Councilmember Juniman's on um, the safety action. I was m more or less wondering how does the interaction between our uh, Maplewood police and um, the Metro Transit police re work and um, what, what, what does the response look like? So if there's an issue on one of our BRT platforms, um, what's the response rate um, on that? And then I have a side comment about um, the ambassador program. I am a huge advocate of the ambassador program, and I know it's working through this legislature and has to have that approval first. Um, but the, the one thing that I would um, just urge uh, anybody who um, has the ability to is to maybe not put associate it with the, um, the fairs because I think what's really um, positive that I've seen in other communities is having an ambassador program is separate from 
the police department, and they're not really seen as that. And so they're more look, looked at as like, you know, safety and where am I going? And, and then the other thing that we really need to focus on is um, in order to prevent crime, we got to keep it clean. So how can we make sure that maybe the ambassadors can help out with things like that? So. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I appreciate your comments on that program, and, and it's, it gets back to speaking of what I talked about earlier, of having a, a well-regulated system, a presence on that system. And obviously, it, it, it's engagement versus enforcement. I firmly believe in that. I firmly believe that we need people out on the system, just like you speak of, that are wayfinders, that are people helping you learn how to use a ticket vending machine, um, how to get from point A to point B on the system. Um, and they can be all over that system helping with that. Um, getting back to the first part of your question with relationship with Maplewood Police, um, you know, obviously we don't have a daily relationship with the city of Maplewood Police Department. That's not a bad thing. But the good thing is, is we do work well together when we need to, and um, we both are mission specific. Obviously the city um, takes care of things within the city, and the city is the primary law enforcement agency for anything that would happen in the city of Maplewood. So, um, as Metro Transit Police Officer, we're very mission specific. Obviously, it's things just relating to uh, bus operations in our facilities um, within the city of Maplewood. Um, obviously, we listen and talk with each other. If, if, if we see a problem stemming, uh, I'll use the Maplewood uh, Transit Center. Um, we've had some history there in the past of, um, you know, obviously with the ridership down and the facility not being used as much, we have had unsheltered people there and, and people using that for, for unintended purposes. Um, and we communicate with each other and we try to find the best practices to deal with that. And that's, we used our HAP team for that at the request of the city of Maplewood. So very good relationship. And uh, I just have to remember that Metro Transit Police aren't here to take over policing in the city of Maplewood. We're here to help support the people of Maplewood, <coughs> Maplewood and the transit system. Uh, yes, question for Thank you. Question for the chief. Uh, <laughs> safety is obviously a very big issue. Yeah. There was an article in the Star Tribune within the last two weeks, and they reported that the crime rates across the transit system had increased by 50% in 2022 from 2021. And the article talked about the safety plan that you had, the 40-point safety plan that you had talked about that was initiated back in June of 2022, which is basically smack dab in the middle of a year where the crime rate increased by 50%. Uh, I mean, obviously, that is a very big concern. Uh, not that long ago, there was another article that I saw, and I, I shared it with Met Council staff, uh, and it looked at light rail, just light rail was my understanding, and it looked at major metropolitan cities across the country. Uh, some of the cities, I think, were Cleveland and Detroit, just a number of, of other large metropolitan cities. And Minneapolis-St. Paul was the number one metropolitan area in terms of crime rates on light rail. And so the numbers are not good. And I guess what I am questioning is what are other cities doing that we're not? And have we looked at what other cities are doing? And, and what are we going to do so that we don't have that notoriety of having such a high crime rate in our transit system? Yeah, there's kind of two questions here. Obviously, the first one is in relation to our own mm -hmm. uh, statistics that we're keeping. Um, I'm not a statistic academic, but anyone that looks at a graph can realize there's something going on out there. Obviously, uh, we're dealing with a lot of issues that we've never dealt with before. Um, and, and I've taken some heat on that comment in the past because what do you mean, uh, drug abuse and addiction, things of that nature? We're not, we've never seen that so prevalent in our society as we have in the last, uh, you know, since 2020, quite frankly, as, as we got into the pandemic. And it's, and it's very difficult. Um, it's very hard when you're getting calls of, of, you know, people struggling from addiction using narcotics on our system or at our stations. And those are things we've never seen in the past. And they've gone way up. We need help as a region in dealing and getting these folks help with these problems because that's what drives those numbers up, those quality of life 
things, the, uh, the mental health and addiction. Um, and and the, uh, the other part of that too is, um, you know, the numbers are up, but we're kind of, the police departments are kind of their own worst enemy at that. Um, say you went out um, and, and did a crime reduction detail and, and went out and just hit something really hard. I mean, I'll, I'll use fair evasion. You know, we, we have a specific policy on how we do fair evasion and, and enforce that, right? If we took that policy away and just went out and cited everybody for fair evasion, we could drive our crime rate numbers up 200%. Um, there's a lot of different variables there, and what we try to do the best is kind of digest, hey, what's the root cause of this, or what, what are the part A, part B, the most more violent things, and the more of the less quality of life things. And um, even though our crime rate is up in the smaller quality of life things, the, the more violent things are not, um, um, they're there, but it's not like we had a 54% increase in, say, aggravated robberies. Um, but yeah, we need help. The region needs help with this. Um, the, getting back to the, uh, the article you referred to the, in the Center for American Experiment, I believe it is, um, that, that's a very interesting topic. And quite frankly, uh, I think, you know, how do we compare to other agencies? I think we report everything. I think Metro Transit does a really good job of saying, should we report this or doesn't it fall into the requirements? And we report everything. We're very transparent. I have a hard time personally, I'm not speaking for the council on this, I'm speaking for Rick Grates as the police chief going, how can Sacramento and Denver and San Diego and these other places have zero incidents? That's just, to me, uh, is an underreporting issue and I think that that causes big disparity on what we look like here. I hope that makes sense. What Thank I'm, you. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, I actually have a question about sustainability for uh, peop um, the uh, drivers. So <laughs> my question is around uh, sustainability is a big part of anything that we do. And as we all know, the great recognition has taken place this last uh, few years here. Um, you know, my, my question is around, uh, you talk a little bit about how we have the, the operators and we also have scheduled operators uh, routes that you guys want to put out there. I want to know a little bit more about what does that projection look like the next five years here? Um, what are you looking to hire? Um, you know, you put this beautiful thing in and you don't have people to ride bus to drive the buses. Um, what does that look like from a projection perspective? Council member, great question. We don't know. But I can tell you that uh, we're ahead of the curve compared to other transit systems and how we manage our service and deliver it. Right now we're turning the corner we have the budget right now to hire another 200 operators. If we could get them, we'd hire them. And that puts us back in the position of where we were probably back in 2021 and halfway to where we were in 2019. So we don't know what the workforce projection looks like, but if we can start to get some traction on our hiring practices now, and it seems like we are, we're making some progress that we can get ourselves back to a place where we're providing a lot more service than, it, than we are now. <clears throat> and uh, we just have to wait and see. We're, this is, no one knows. Every transit system is having this problem. Um, I recently was looking at some information from LA Metro and California, and they miss three to 10% of their trips every day on their system because they don't have the workforce they need. And so we're trying to find that balance between how much service do we put out for our workforce. Uh, but I think the, the bottom line is everyone's having the same challenge. If I, I wish I knew we're going to build a plan with Network Now that says how we would build that back as soon as the workforce comes. But as we sit here today at the beginning of February 2023, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be moving in a positive direction this year and the next five years. How far we can get on that, I don't know. but. Uh, we're prepared from a budget standpoint to do it and an infrastructure standpoint to do it. We just need the people to come and know that Metro Trance is a great place to work. And, and just out of curiosity, are we the only Metro that's having this issue or is this a common thing across the board with other bus routes and companies and everything else? Council member, we're, we are every single industry in transit across North America is having the problem. I'm glad you asked that question because it's important to know that we're not alone and we talk to our peer agencies across the country to say what are you doing and what are you doing and how are you attracting mm -hmm. the opportunity for more bus operators to come in and so it's we're trading notes across the country to figure out what works best in each market so 
uh, it's a challenge. And APTA recently put a report out that I think said that they were struggling, uh, I want to say it's 67% uh, of agencies are well below where they want to be. Thank you. We'll go uh, one, two, three. Okay, and I think it might be for you, sir. Um, thanks everybody for coming and doing your presentations. They were really, they were really good. Um, my question is gonna be on some of the numbers you had for the, like by 2040, slide number 26. Um, a lot of the information that also you presented, it was post-COVID. It was before, or pre-COVID. Um, and then some of it was right before COVID hit. So a lot of the information in there is still based off those old meetings with people, old numbers. And one of the things that gets talked about a lot is Maplewood Mall. And it was talked about how that's a big destination and it's gonna be for 2040. And it's just, it seems to be one of the, the top places in this, in this purple line. And it's really not what it used to be probably in 2017. So I see it constantly being played in here where maybe it used to be something and it's really not anymore. And that's a big piece to take out of this, the purple line. And so I'm wondering where we're gonna go in the future because this stuff, it shows it in there and the numbers are built on that when really that's not the case anymore. Well, Council Member, good question. I'll start and then I'll hand it to Craig because I think you're referring to the purple line number at, in 2040. Mm -hmm. uh, but Maplewood Mall for us is the center of connection and I, have, I will acknowledge in my 28 years here, Maplewood Mall has changed a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it's not maybe as much of a destination for our current riders right now, but it is an important focal point for where those connections happen. And the adjacent land use around Maplewood still continues to be some of our destinations uh, for our customers as well. But okay. I'll let Craig respond to the 2040. Thank you, Adam. Uh, again, Craig Lamoth, uh, Purple Line Project Manager. Uh, appreciate the question. And so as it relates to the ridership and uh, first clearing up, when we refer to Maplewood Mall, we probably should actually refer to it the way that we see it, which is really the greater district. So it's not just the mall facility itself, it's really the north end, and that's how our ridership model is actually built on. So it includes St. John's, it also includes uh, the forecast for 2040, which are reflective of the north end plan. So that was a 10 year vision plan showing an urban street network, a lot of development, some of which has occurred, some of which is still yet to occur. Um, and so uh, if you know on one of Eric's slides, he had the bar chart and he showed a purple piece to it and that was uh, 3,500 in 2019, uh, what we consider current year. And then on the slide I presented was 5,400. A lot of that growth is coming from areas like the North End uh, District of Maplewood, but also other areas along the corridor. Um, so from that standpoint, we're recognizing the future growth as much as we are recognizing uh, what's out there today. Um, as it relates to accounting for changes in a post-pandemic, I, I mentioned some of those things before where we've basically lowered and discounted uh, reliance on park and ride because we were showing a parking ramp at uh, the Harvest Park area back only two years ago. We're talking about a surface lot now. Um, we're really focusing on the trips that uh, we're seeing out there in the system, which are those all-day, all-purpose trips, which is why our newest and latest ridership forecasts only reflect a reliance on downtown tri trips that are destined there of 20%. It was higher previously. Uh, if you go back even to 2021 to the environmental document that was put out for public comment, granted it's a different project, but the project to downtown White Bear Lake had about 7,000 instead of 5,400 uh, in that document. And a lot of that is to, through the ridership forecasting that we've continuously done, we're reflecting what we believe is the forecasting of the future, pivoting more closely from what we're seeing here. But we are still uh, using an older federal model. It's the most current federal model, but it hasn't transitioned fully to a post-pandemic. Uh, a lot of regions throughout the country are waiting for what's known as a travel behavior inventory, where it's an extensive survey of how do people travel. And that was done last year in this region. That information will become available hopefully by the end of March to help and refine and better uh, create models for the future. Okay, and then just a follow up, and it's with you, sir. Um, number page 27, the advanced station planning process, and it says opportunities for pedestrian and bi bicycle infrastructure improvements. Can you just give us a brief, what does that mean and what does it look like? Because it, I can't picture that. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Council Member. 
So through that process, what we're looking at is both identifying immediate direct access to the proposed stations, and some of which we've factored and incorporated into the scope of the project. So building sidewalk segments that don't exist today, uh, building uh, trail segments that don't exist today that directly provide access to the platforms. But then we're also, through that stationary planning process, going out to like a quarter mile uh, distance from each of the station platforms. So really trying to identify with the planned station there, how do we provide the best access possible? So a lot of that is through that process, we're identifying, working with local partners, the counties and the cities along the alignment, to figure out what some of those facility improvements, trails and sidewalks that are outside the immediate area. And then helping to identify it through our resources, through the station area planning efforts, to then reflect in CIPs for the county or the cities along the alignment so that over time, um, money can be found to provide for those uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements. But we're really looking at how to expand um, the typical 10-minute walk to a platform, which is going to differ station by station depending on the infrastructure that's mm -hmm. there or not there, and trying to really be able to uh, represent a 10-minute walk out to about a quarter mile. But that's only if the sidewalks and trails are there. And that can be tricky, too, because you have a lot of homes around there and businesses, so I want to make sure we're not taking people's property. Correct. Yes, we are staying primarily within public right-of-way, um, particularly for what we're talking about here. Okay. 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 Uh, Torn. Yeah. On, oh, I just wanted to add one clarifying point. I just found the American Public Transit Association, and they say that 96% of agencies surveyed reported a workforce shortage, 84% shortages affecting their ability to provide service. So that was in October 2022, just a stat I threw out there. Thanks. And on that note, um, I just want to piggyback kind of off of the last question regarding the routing of the line. Um, we heard a lot about the historical use of the line being over a railroad for over 100 years, as well as uh, um, some of the development that we might be expecting along that line. One of the things I was wondering is uh, oftentimes uh, in conversations with others, we hear, well, why wasn't it run down White Bear? Why wasn't it run down Highway 61? So I'm just curious, what are uh, the best practices that we've been, or that the Met Council has been looking at as far as why it was run down this beyond just it being the quickest point or the quickest way between two points. I'm actually going to turn that question over to the voice that we heard earlier. Um, since that decision was made uh, pre-2017, uh, so Mike, if you're still there, um, yep. if you want to tackle here, that Craig. one. Yeah, okay, I'll start with um, some of the kind of the nuance here. It's a great question. Uh, we looked at both of those routes in our studies, and we looked at them quite a bit. And what we found with Highway 61 is that it was a very narrow corridor as you went from Phelan Boulevard north. It's, it's more of that Arcade Street piece in St. Paul. It's super narrow. You'd have a lot of parking impacts to have a dedicated corridor there, and you'd start to have right-of-way impacts as well where you started to get into the sidewalk to have everything fit. As you went north of uh, the county line, or not the county line, but the city line, you started to get into an area where there was a lot of natural areas, a lot of parklands, not a lot of destination. So then your ridership potential dropped off quite a bit on Highway 61. As you got north of 36, more of that happened where you started to have businesses that were set back a long way from the road. The road really functions more as an expressway there than it does as a, a city street. And there just wasn't a lot of there there as you had some wetlands on the west side and again, just not a lot of density. And when these studies were done, uh, Costco wasn't there. The development that had happened around County Road D and the realignment of D really hadn't happened yet. So there wasn't a lot of there there prior to getting to Maplewood Mall. When we looked at White Bear Avenue, we ran into uh, somewhat of a similar situation when it came down to right-of-way impact. Uh, not so much the lack of things there, because as you know, White Bear Avenue has transit service today. There's a lot of things going on in White Bear Avenue or on White Bear Avenue, whether it's St. Paul or whether it's Maplewood. Um, but the big issue became right of way impacts and travel time. It was slower, and the right of way impacts in, to get a dedicated corridor in place essentially meant you had to take out one side of the, the road because you just couldn't fit things in there while maintaining the travel lanes that are there today. And Back then, that's what was the expectation, that you maintained the four lanes of, high, of road traffic and you put in dedicated space for transit. 
Thank you very much. Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. I, I think mine are both facilities questions. Um, first of all, this was in the reported in the news back a ways. I wouldn't. I think it was November, um, and in the paper concerning the gold line, and it was a question that I never heard the answer to. Originally, it said there would be 17 all-electric buses. And then it was updated to say there would be 12 diesel buses and five electric. Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, Gold Line, again, for those who aren't familiar, goes from downtown St. Paul uh, through Maplewood, Landfall, Oak, Oakdale, and Woodbury. Uh, that dedicated one has uh, started with 12 buses diesel and they've added five electric buses. So now we have 17 buses to that project, um, which uh, just just today was federally funded. Uh, so it, that's a 17 bus facility. Whereas Purple Line, the current plan is 17, 17 buses, might be updated, but they're all electric on the Purple Line. So the Gold Line added electric buses, Purple Line has started with all electric. Gold Line, when Gold Line began to, uh, electric buses uh, were um, the technology had not advanced to the point they are today. We're we're pretty confident in the operation of electric buses now that we've been had them in service at Metro Transit. So, because pre-activation of the Gold Line, there was a promise of more electric buses than they are now have. Is there going to be an updating so they will have more electric buses? Are you there is a lack. Uh, council member, there is electric buses that are being purchased for the gold line, yes. Okay. And we, as Metro Transit last year, we adopted uh, what is the zero emission bus plan, which is our plan in the region to transition our, our entire fleet towards electric or zero emission. It doesn't have to be electric necessarily. Be uh, and so we believe in the next five years, our goal is for 20% of our buses that we purchase to be electric. And then as the technology advances, we... we in the long term, envision an entire fleet eventually to get to a zero emission. Thank you, because environmentally that's mm -hmm. really important. Correct. And then I have a more mundane question, um, but since we're the not so proud owners of a now defunct park and ride, what's the future of a closed park and ride like the one on C and 61? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, it is a challenge that we're going to be dealing with in a number of places, both determining if that's the case, and if that is the case, how do we dispatch it if that's what we're going to do or repurpose it. So there's a lot of thinking yet to do to determine how we're going to do that. It depends on who the landowner is. Some of them are owned by the city. Some of them are owned by MnDOT. Um, so some of them we own. So we need to think about how that might transition if that's going to be the case. In the mean, meantime, I guess this is now becomes a public safety question, but you could try and answer it. In the meantime, does that mean we're responsible for it or you're responsible for it and then whatever activity that it may attract? Council member, at the time, we are responsible for it. Thank you. I, uh, I have a, a question here and then a question here. And, and really, I just wanted to say that uh, before we adjourn, I, I want to uh, ask a, a question about scheduling. So I'll defer the time for the question to who's got a question, and so we can come back to my uh, comment before we adjourn. Sure. Yes. We'll go he question here. Yes, just a quick question. We've seen a lot of data on um, numbers up to this point. Um, thinking about the future, what is that forecast? Like, where could I find information on what ridership is going to be? I've been a daily commuter to Minneapolis on a daily basis, and I know traffic is picking up. Um, do you have that information that's available for the public or for residents of Maplewood? Council member, we have some projections on where the trends are going, and right now we're seeing a gradual growth trend, several percent per year at a system level, but we're also looking at each route. And so your experience on Route 270 is one that we're watching. It's not the only one that we're watching to say, we're seeing a lot more rides on this route, and so do we either deploy a larger transit vehicle, larger bus, or do we add another trip when we're, uh, when we're able to, when we have an operator to do it? So we're watching that. Uh, and again, it's that balancing act between do we have enough operators to add, or how can we accommodate that? And part of that is looking at what are the schedule times? Do we need, 
need to make adjustments there to help provide that capacity. But overall, we're looking at a general overall growth trend that's pretty modest, but we're seeing a steady trend uh, over the past year where we're seeing growth. I don't know, Eric, if we have a percentage of what we've seen over the last year in terms of growth, but it's steady. Okay. I, and I can see the, the steady growth charts online also, but just trying to get an understanding of what that looks like. Thanks. Yeah, I would only add, um, you know, I think since the late summer of 2020, we've grown by about 50%. It's kind of been like a steady growth in that way. Um, you mentioned online charts at metrotransit.org slash performance. We have every month updated ridership, not just the system total, but uh, each BRT line, LRT line, uh, commuter express, and so forth. Um, and the last thing I'll say is we, we are currently doing um, forecasts for internal use in terms of budgeting and ridership expectations, and we do a number of scenarios there too, but really, um, yeah, we're, we're expecting growth to continue, and we look forward to trying to meet it with service. Well, thank you, Task Force members, for the first. Well, I'll get to the, your comment earlier. I did want to say that that the agenda is called for roughly two hour increments, and so uh, we we've exhausted kind of the time. And so, the, for the community members, there's going to be two sessions and opportunities to provide direct comment to the task force members. Uh, and the next session is going to be on um, February 15th at 6 p.m. in this room, and the uh, Rush Line Coalition. Uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot the acronym. I'm missing, I think I'm missing a letter, uh, <laughs> Representative Longry. But um, you are going to be a presenter for the entire duration of the two hours. And so ideally what we would expect is an, uh, roughly an hour of presentation and then an hour of question and dialogue with the task force members. And so I wanted to forecast that, but you had a different question. Um, well, actually, that does piggyback on my question, is that um, the, the date, because we have approximately five presenters that have specialty areas, and we are all volunteers. And as it turns out, um, we did not know what date was uh, set for us because it was just put there, published, and said they will present. And unfortunately, three of our five presenters are not available that day. So I was wondering if it's something that the uh, committee here would consider that we can uh, have the No Rush Line Coalition be able to uh, have theirs on a different date, maybe swap with some other particular uh, presentation time because we were never consulted on that particular date and unfortunately it just happened to be that uh, our good luck that uh, the date that was selected for us uh, three of our five presenters uh, will not be available one will be in the next room in the Maplewood room chairing the Parks Commission and so you know she's doing double duty even and she's she'll be in the next room so that's, I guess that's what I wanted to bring forward to, uh, to the committee here and to see if that's something that we, we can accomplish here today. Uh, I will look to the mayor to respond first. Sure, thank you very much. You know, trying to set up something like this that is so robust and provides so many opportunities uh, for our community to weigh in and share their thoughts uh, is really a challenging thing. I know that there is one time when I can't be here because I will be out of state. Uh, so it's, it, it's challenging to work with everyone's schedule, but in trying to design this and figure out how we can all have some of the same foundational information, it was decided that we would do this in a very data-driven way and that the Met Council would start out, uh, we would hear from the No Rush Line Coalition, and then we would hear from the businesses, and then we would have uh, open uh, residents and businesses and anybody that, that wants to talk. But what we are trying to set up is a foundation so that we all have the same information. This information is going to be available online. It will be, um, uh, you know, we'll put uh, this information online. I'm sure we can get it there. Uh, but there will be, you know, you can go right to our city website. And I want to make sure that everyone who has an opportunity to come uh, either on the 28th or the 8th uh, has all of this foundational information. And so that we're all kind of looking at the same set of facts. 
And so I, I recognize that it's very difficult, and sometimes we have to kind of go with the very best that we can. What we with, are doing, with, do though, is that, for instance, there's one that I'm not going to be able to attend, but I can watch it online, and I can listen to it, and so we can tune in. So we're, we're trying to make this work, but there are just so many people, with, and I think if we miss out on those on kind of the way that we have structured this, I, I don't think that we're going to have the kind of engagement that I really would like to have because I want to hear from everyone's with, position. With due respect, Mayor, uh, we were not consulted on the date and we are data-driven and our five people that are presenting, they are specialists in their fields and they will be able to provide that data, but they, they we can't just have people read off flashcards in their stead, who will answer the questions on the data that they have to present. And so we're only asking to flip it with one of the other, the other one of the other meetings. That's all we're asking. You know, and in we trying are to set this up as well. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, in the, the communication with your group and with, with City Manager Coleman, uh, it was agreed that you would have a representative for that time. That was uh, after you know, we, that are, that was after me, we can asked. I finish, please? That was after we asked can to I have it changed. Finish? Can please. I please finish? Thank you. It would be okay if there are questions. Maybe what we could do is we could do the question portion of it uh, and, and maybe share that with the 22nd. But I don't want to... I really want to make sure that all of our residents have the information from the Met Council, from your group, from everybody else. And I think that if we dilute this, I'm not going to feel that we have given everybody that opportunity. No. Yeah. Councilmember Cave. Yes, I just I just want to make a comment. Sure. Um, I believe we are an advisory committee, so maybe the advisory committee needs to make the, the decision on that. I think everybody here, this is a really big topic and unfortunately I'm sorry to hear that you had so many people who couldn't make it but it would be like the group tonight not being able to make it and I think I think we can switch a date or add a date later at the end whatever yeah. no I just I, I just think it's important that when p this is such a big thing to the community and to not have speakers and they announce that they couldn't speak I'm just in favor of picking a new date for them I Uh, Mayor, members of the Council Advisory Committee, um, the Met Council didn't have a choice either. We set the schedule with the Council, and the Met Council made the accommodation to come tonight. I believe that if there's two people from the No Rush Line group, that's a pretty good number that can, can share the slides and the information. If there's questions, that they, the specialty people have to answer, they can answer them at the next meeting and we can have that interchange then. So, because we haven't, to be honest, so we don't have a very big turnout from the business community, so you could share that meeting perhaps. I haven't heard from a lot of people in the business community. The other thing is, I know that uh, Ms. Mellett is on the Park and Rec Commission. They're going to be reviewing strategic plan and park plans with the new members, and I think Terry's probably very familiar with that material and may be able to miss that meeting or reschedule the park and rec meeting. So I think there's some other things that could happen. I'd prefer not to change the schedule because there are members of the business community that are set on coming on that date. So we, I don't know how, we can't, we can't prolong this. There's deadlines that have been established. And other than that, so, there's, yep. there's there's Let's Mr. Sable has a calendar that he's working with. We all have a calendar that we're working with, so we really prefer not to do a switch. We can share maybe that third meeting between the two groups and follow up with questions, hear what they're comfortable presenting that night, and then we'll have questions the third night. I'm just suggesting we work something out. We're, we got together is, is and, we you know. We have sent 500 postcards to people with the calendar, okay. to all the people that actually live along the trail, that these meetings are these times. I, I live on the trail and I didn't get a calendar. Well, you'll get it soon. It went in the mail today or yesterday. Okay. Um, it's very, very, hold on. All right. Very, yeah, I was going to say, I, was, I, can, I can weigh in. 
Yeah. yeah uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go. I'm done. Task Force Member Longer, if you want to reach out to me, we will try to uh, figure out a, a reasonable accommodation. I do think it's important. Uh, part of the establishment of the process was to, again, have the information come first and then the framing and the dialogue to come second. And I think that's an important uh, procedural step. Mm -hmm. So if, if you'd be willing to, to reach out to myself and to City Manager Coleman, we okay. can figure out a way to have maybe a hybrid accommodation. I think that's probably an appropriate uh, step. And maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not three hours, but maybe it's two and a half hours over two days. And so, but I, I do think that mm -hmm. the data presentation part is an essential component of the first phase. Uh, and so then the, and then the opinion and the feedback in the next phase and then the framing of the, of the recommendations would come at the end. Um, again, this is a, uh, this is, there's a lot of information. There were 58 slides tonight. And I think at some point um, people will be reflecting on, I, boy, I, re I really wish I had asked a separate question. And so there's going to be more opportunity for dialogue and for, and for feedback. And again, I encourage people to go to the city's website. You can rewatch this presentation. The slide decks will be available. The information will be available. So this is, I think, a, a process that compounds, right? Each meeting builds on the other, which leads to a conclusion at the end. And again, the purpose of the, of the advisory group and the advisory task force is to provide information to the policymakers to make an informed choice. And so how we get there, um, the materials they get there is important. And so I think at the end, um, w giving the city council the information to, with which to make a choice matters. Mm -hmm. um, procedurally, it might be, um, I think the technical term would be maybe potentially messy. But at the end of the day, all of the information will be provided, all of the input will be gathered, and then the decision-making authority will then rest with the council. And I think if you'd be willing to reach out in the interim, because there is a two-week period uh, between meetings, I think that would be helpful. So with that, uh, we are only 10 minutes over our allotted time, which feels like a, a successful uh, outcome. Uh, we will try to be more diligent around ending it with a hard stop time, because I know people have uh, transportation needs. They might have child care issues and other things. But I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, looking forward to your comments, and I appreciate your participation. Uh, thank you to the task force members for having me. And uh, we will follow up uh, at the end. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um.